Ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you to today's webcast brought to you by the UBS Center for Economics and Society. It's the third in the Center's newly launched webinar series, Economics of Global Challenges. Do Google, Amazon and other tech companies really create more wealth or do they just make us all poorer? That's precisely the question we want to discuss today. My name is Florian Scheuer and I'm the UBS Foundation Professor of Economics of Institutions at the Department of Economics here at the University of Zurich. Almost exactly two weeks ago today, the European Court of Justice ruled in favor of the EU Commission in a landmark ruling on a series of billion euro fines imposed against Google. The US tech giant now must pay an eye-watering fine of more than two billion euros for abuse of market power in their price comparison service, Google Shopping. So as you can see, these questions couldn't be more topical. But it's not just Google or other tech firms that have incredible influence on both the market and our society. There's increasing evidence that because of technological change and globalization, more and more companies nowadays have market power that they can exploit to their advantage. That raises the question, do these superstar companies undermine competition? Do they hold the wages of workers down? Do they endanger the prosperity of our society? And if yes, what can we do about it? Today, tackling this very question, I'm very excited to welcome Jan Eckhout here with me in the studio. Jan is ICREA Research Professor at Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. He's a worldwide leading expert in macroeconomics with a special emphasis on the labor market. He has done seminal research on unemployment, labor market risk, skill diversity, inequality in cities, and the macroeconomic implications of market power. But Jan is not only a terrific scientist, dare I say a superstar scientist, uh, he also just released a new book entitled The Profit Paradox, How Thriving Firms Threaten the Future of Work, which just came out this summer and has already made quite some splash in the public. It does a beautiful job in connecting these complex economic issues to the everyday lives of ordinary workers and consumers. Over the course of the next hour, Jan will explain to us how over the past 40 years, a small number of companies have reaped most of the rewards for technological advancements, acquiring rivals, securing huge profits, and thus creating unequal outcomes for workers. The consequences are not just unnecessarily high prices for consumers, but also fewer startups that are still able to compete, rising inequality, stagnating wages, and reduced social mobility. But before we start, I'd like to give you, our audience, some logistical information. And that's because Jan will be conducting live interactive polls throughout his presentation, and you'll also be able to ask questions which we'll then have the opportunity to take up in roughly half an hour after Jan's presentation. So to take part, please open a new tab in your internet browser, browser on your phone or computer, go to menti.com and type in the code 52.52.450. That uh, code should also be shown uh, on the screen. And even if you don't have any questions, you can still log in to view all the questions that have been submitted by other participants and you can also vote for the best ones by giving them a thumbs up or, of course, also a thumbs down if you don't find a particular question uh, particularly interesting. All right, Jan, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Florian. When one kid bullies another, one child suffers. When a teacher in the classroom doesn't care, 20 children suffer. But when the education system is broken, millions suffer. Today, there's one system that's broken, and it affects everyone in the world. Now, to find out and to answer the question, which system that is that's broken, I'll take you to a meeting I had with my friend Alex. This is about two years ago, before the pandemic. I meet Alex in a bar, and as I meet him, I ask him, Alex, how's life in California? And then he tells me, life's no good. I'm moving out. I have to close down my business. And as he explains to me, what has happened to his business. He also uh, tells me the details of why he's moving out and looking for a job. But at the same time, we see from the corner of our eyes on a TV monitor in the bar, the news announcement of the Dow Jones reaching new highs. Then it was 25,000. 
And the news anchor was talking about how great news that was for the economy, how healthy the economy was. And Alex was just shaking his head. He said, no, not for me. That didn't do it for me. My business didn't thrive in that, you know, great environment, healthy economy. And as the bartender was joining us, bringing us the beer, she had been popping in and out of the conversation. She says, I've been doing this job since 2004, and today I take home exactly the same wage as I did back then. So how can it be that, you know, we have on the one hand an economy that has markets, stock markets that are uh, at, at highs and making records each time, and at the same time, normal people don't see any of that. And it's because a system is broken, and the system that's broken is the competition in the economy. And what I want to talk to you about today is precisely the facts that are behind that, the data that show what the impact is of this broken system, what the impact is on everyone. It's affecting everyone. It's affecting you know, people like Alex and the bartender, but it's also affecting you for the price that you pay for the beer that the bartender serves you, and it's affecting the economy as a whole. Now, let's start and take a look at uh, uh, some of the facts. So let me start first by talking a little bit about the facts behind what's going on with the stock market. And so to do that, first, I would like to ask you to uh, respond to the mentee poll. And let's take a look at the first question. And my question is, how much did the Dow Jones grow annually? So what is the annual growth rate adjusted for inflation? And I want you to think about two periods. The first period is the post-war period from 1945 to 1980. And the second period is from 1980 to today. And you have three options. The first option, A, is it grew 7% from 45 to 80 and 0% from 1980 to today. B is 4% 45 to 1980 and 4% in the second period. And C is 0% post-war, 7% in the second period. So if you can go to Menti right now, um, cast your votes, and then we'll have an idea about what's going on. And by the time your votes come in, we'll take a look at, uh, at how, uh, what your opinions are, what the general opinion is of the audience. And I see uh, coming in, I see uh, at the, the majority at the moment uh, coming in at 4% at, uh, and 4% option B. There's uh, no one who's voting for option A at the moment. Uh, there's a number of people who are voting for uh, option C. Let me just wait for one or two more seconds to see if more votes come in. Well, let's move on and let's take a look at what uh, the data says. So basically the majority says that the return in real uh, uh, terms has been 4% in the first period and 4% in the second period. Let's now uh, take a look uh, at uh, what the data say. So here's the Dow Jones starting in 1945, and if you look at the evolution, you'll see what happens. Until 1980, there was an increase and then a decrease, but basically the return was zero. And from 1980, and onward, 1980 onwards, there's been a very sharp rise in the, the Dow Jones. And again, this is inflation adjusted. This is not, and it has not anything to do with, with price levels. So what I want you to take away from this is that this is really, 1980 is really a turning point when things start to change. Things change in the sense that the, um, the, the stock market returns are a lot higher since that period for the last four decades than they used to be before. And it's not that that was a period of slow growth. I mean, in fact, it was a period of much higher growth in, in some uh, periods with the, the rebuilding after the, the, the Second World War. So it was a, a very prosperous period between 45 and 1980, but the stock market didn't show that. Okay. Now, from 1980 to 2020, we see this 7% per year average growth, and in particular, in fact, the last uh, uh, nearly 15 years after the Great Recession has been where the growth has been uh, the, the highest. And this is going to be at the crux of what the profit paradox is about, that we see this enormous growth in profitability, because in the end, what does the stock market tell us? It tells us that there is growth in profits, because that's what customers, sorry, investors expect to, uh, to receive when they invest, and so that's why the, the stock market prices are going up. Now, what is going on in the economy beyond this profitability? Well, the economy is a bit like a firm. The surplus that a firm generates 
is basically divide between what you pay to workers, what you pay out in machines and investment, and the rest is profits. And if you look at what this division of the pie was in 1981, we see that workers get around two-thirds, machine about one-third, and profits at that time were two uh, percent. But what happened since then? Well, consistent with what we see, what happened in the, with the Dow Jones is that profits have been growing in the economy and they're reaching 14 percent in 2019. So the, the, the share of the pie that's going to profits has, in, has increased. Now, the story that we've been talking about, uh, uh, both of Alex, the entrepreneur and the bartender, is of course is the story of one individual. And the question we may want to ask is, how general is this? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at startups, OK? And we're going to look at the data on startups. And we want to compare the fraction of startups today compared to those in the late 1970s. And before we look at the data, I would like to ask you again to enter the Menti poll and um, answer the following question. What is the fraction of startups today compared to that fraction in the late 1970s? And the, answer, the, the answers options are, A, is that double? Are there today double as many startups as there were in 1970s? B, is it about the same? And C, or C, is it about half? So if you can go to Menti right now and enter your, uh, your answers to this poll. And then in a second, again, we will look at what uh, the data tells us what we see as the evolution of the fraction of startups. You want to think of the fraction of startups as take all firms and what is the, the, the fraction of those firms that are really new firms. And I see the first numbers of the poll coming in and it says about uh, the majority says that uh, uh, it's option A, it's double. So the uh, number of startups today is double as high as it was in the late uh, 70s. Uh, a, a minority says that it's, it's about the same, and then a larger part says that it's, it's half. So basically, the number of startups have, have declined. Well, let's take a look at uh, what the data says again. Okay, so here we're going to see the evolution of startups uh, starting in 1978 when we have the date, and then we go all the way to today. And in 1978, the number of the fraction, rather, of startups was around uh, 14%. And what has happened since then is that the number of startups, while fluctuating, has been uh, dropping to below uh, 8%. And so basically, this is nearly halving the number of startups. So the, the right answer for this question had been that you know, it has, it's, it's half, so that would have been uh, option, option uh, C. Now, this is surprising. And I'm not surprised that the majority was saying that the number of startups today is higher than it was before. because. If you think about growth, if you think about an economy that's uh, uh, innovating, you know, we talked earlier about Silicon Valley, it's the land of the startups. And you think that naturally the number of startups now with these new technologies, with these new firms coming along, along would be larger than uh, they were back in the late 70s. And, and actually we see that the opposite is true. There's the decline in the number of startups. And the story of Alex, that I was telling you at the start, is not just you know, an N equals one story. It's a much more general story. It's a much more general pattern. In fact, what happened to Alex is that um, he had a new technology for mobile communication between mobile phones to make peer-to-peer -peer communication easier and, 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 and uh, more effective. And some of the big mobile phone uh, producers were interested in this technology. They talked to him about taking over his company. But eventually what he ended up doing, as he said, he, he showed them the light. And their engineers basically managed to develop it themselves by the interaction over two and a half years uh, uh, with him uh, talking about the technology, how, how he did that. And I think that is one story that is indicating that something more general is going on because, of course, on the other side, he had one of the large, big-name companies that was uh, uh, involved in that. Now, we had the story of the startups. We can go further and go back to our uh, bartender. Is the story of the bartender's wages, is that the same? So let's ask again the, uh, another question. This is going to be the last one uh, on, on Menti. So my question is, what is or what was the annual growth rate of wages of non-supervisory workers? And by that, I mean workers who are not managers. This is about 85% uh, of the entire workforce. And again, we want to look at two periods, the post-war period, 1945 to 1980, and then 1980 to today. And you have three options. Option A is it was 2% wage growth 
in the post-war period and zero from 1980 onwards. It was B, 1% in both periods, or it was C, zero uh, in the post-war period and 2% uh, today. So let's wait for a few more seconds for these uh, answers to come in. I see that the majority is uh, saying option, option A, 2% in the post-war period and zero today. Um, some people say that it's uh, option C, 0% in the, uh, the post-war period and 2% uh, today. Let's give it one more second. Okay, some. So the answer we'll see now by taking a look at the data. What I'm going to show you in the next graph is I'm going to show you the evolution of two things. The first thing is a measure of productivity. Think of this as how much output is being produced per worker, for all workers. Okay? And I'm going to normalize this at one in uh, the 1940s. And I'm going to show you in the same graph the evolution of wages. And the evolution of wages is basically saying what is the average wage of a worker who uh, uh, is a non-production worker, okay? which is 80%, 85% of all, all the workers. I didn't mean a non-production worker, I meant a production worker, but a non-supervisory worker, excuse me. So let's take a look at this uh, evolution, and we see that productivity and wages initially are moving in lockstep, but something changes in 1980. In 1980, what we see is that wages are starting to stagnate. And this is the stagnating wages that people have been talking about and that also Florian mentioned in the introduction. And this is, again, something that occurs or starts to occur in, in 1980. So the right answer here was indeed 2% in the post-war period, and from 1980 onwards it was uh, 0%. So let's try and understand a little bit more where this is coming from. By the way, again, the story of the bartender is just not the story of one person. It's a much more generalized pattern in, in earnings that we see. Let's take a look where this is coming from. The next graph, uh, we're no longer doing Menti now, so we're just going to go straight to, to the next few facts. If we take a look by people's schooling, by their education, this is, of course, a measure and an imperfect measure of how skillful uh, people are, but I think it's a, a useful measure to, to look at. And if you look at the evolution of wages, again, average wages, normalized to one in the early 1970s, what has happened to that until now? And again, let me start and show you the evolution. And what you'll see is that initially, these wages co move quite a lot until the 1980s. And then from the 1980s, and especially from the 1990s onwards, it all starts to diverge. And the first thing you'll see, of course, is that those with four years or more of college do extremely well. And then we have those with four, year of college, four years of college I thought at least was surprising that they haven't done that much better. They've done a little bit better, but in real terms, they've gained about 10 or 15 percent. Those who have less than four years of college, so two year uh, uh, college degrees, they have about stagnated exactly the same. And those with high school only or less, they've dropped about uh, 10 or 15 percent. And what that tells us is that, of course, there's very different experiences depending on where you are in what we would call the skill uh, 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 distribution. And the striking thing here is that the high school wages have gone down. Now, why is it striking? It's striking because if you think of a world in which there are competitive markets, and when markets are competitive, we know that you're paid whatever you produce, your marginal product. And your marginal product is going to be an indication of basically how valuable you are in terms of producing output. Now, do we really think that since the 1980s, with new technologies, the high, skilled, sorry, uh, the high school uh, graduates have become less productive? I, I can imagine that we think of a, a driver. A driver is no more productive now than she was uh, 40 years ago. But there are also new technologies. People talk about you know, GPS technology that has improved the productivity of drivers in the trucking industry and all the riders for all these companies uh, from, from ride sharing to delivery services have become more productive because they can use technology. So even these low skilled uh, 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 jobs would at least not have been less productive. Now, when we see that there's a decline in the wages, what we can take away from that is that this is really indicating that something is going on with what they receive as a share from what they're producing. Okay? And this is the indicator 
of uh, uh, the fact that there is a, a role for these uh, dominant firms. There's one other implication of, uh, of these dominant firms, and this is something that is, is a little bit more indirect, and it's going to be what I'm going to call job reallocation. And what is job reallocation? It basically says, how frequently do firms change their workforce? How much do they adjust the number of workers that they have? And you can imagine a firm that grows, of course, wants to hire more workers, a firm that faces adverse uh, 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 situations in the economy, wants to fire some workers. So you're going to adjust your workforce depending on what the environment uh, dictates. Now, what we see is that this job reallocation has actually been declining. So if you start in the early 80s, it was around, around 35%. Now it's down to 25%. And job reallocation, you might think, is maybe you know, something that stabilizes people's uh, economic environment. You don't have to move as much. And in fact, related to job reallocation is also the possibility or the, the need for households to move to different uh, cities, all of that has decreased and you might say this is stabilizing uh, uh, workers and, and might be positive, but we see that it also enormously affects the mobility. The promotions decline, the, the, the mobility within the labor market goes down and so workers get stuck much more in their existing jobs. Now all these facts together are effects on the economy as a whole. So I. I've shown you a number of implications that, particularly starting in the 1980s, show that a, a, a huge number of uh, uh, fundamental changes are seen in the economy. Okay? And these macroeconomic changes are going on at the same time when we see, well, and I would say, I would argue these are negative impacts, wage stagnation, the decline in, in the uh, uh, startup rate, these are negative effects. And these are basically coinciding at the same time when we see this you know, rise in profitability, this rise in the stock market that happens at the same time. And so now the question is, you know, how come we got there? What has happened? And what has happened is that there's basically since the 1980s, there's been fast technological change. And fast technological change, of course, has been the age of digitization. And this age of digitization, what does it do? Well, it basically transforms the economy completely. And this, I would like to argue, is basically fast technological change is both the hero and the villain of this economic movie. Why is it the hero? Because we need that technological change to have growth. And in particular, I would you know, want to stress that these firms that are these dominant firms that are the, all the household names in tech, but also in other sectors, textiles or uh, 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 book publishing or whatever beer you, you, you want to uh, uh, consider. These dominant firms are the firms that have heavily innovated initially. And this happened precisely in, well, maybe the late 70s for companies like Microsoft and Apple, a lot of them in the 80s and, and many in the 90s. And that's basically the hero part of both the firms and this technology. But at the same time, these firms and these technologies have used the innovation to create barriers. And these barriers are basically stopping other firms from entering. Let me give you the example of a company like eBay. eBay is a platform and a platform that uh, facilitates the trade of anything from used uh, uh, books to, to, to paintings, if you want. This is something that didn't exist before the 90s when they started uh, uh, this, uh, this company, by the way, which was a startup back then. And what happened to eBay? Well, eBay created enormous amount of value, and that's the hero part of this new technology. We could do a lot of things that were not possible just five years before uh, that existed. And now what happens as a result of that? At the same time, eBay as a platform is a technology that thrives when there's a lot of people on the uh, platform. So scale is the key of uh, the value creation of this, this uh, technology. So the larger it is, the more valuable it is. Now, clearly, what you want is one big platform. 
creating two competing platforms is actually not so good for the customer because I have something to sell. I want where all the buyers are. I want to go there. And if you have something that you want to buy, you want to go where all the sellers are. So really size is what matters. And therefore, you know, these what we call network externalities create economies of scale. And these economies of scale are inherent in such a platform. That allows eBay to charge commissions and fees of 7, 8 or 9 percent. No competitor offering much lower fees can get into that market. Not because their service or their technology is worse, it's just that no customers want to switch platform because the value of the platform is precisely from it being large. And therefore that generates a kind of source of at the same time as you have this innovation, the hero part, you have a source that creates a barrier, that creates a difficulty for a firm to enter. And Yahoo Auctions has tried this for many years. And then eBay used to argue, well, we have just a superior technology. That's why we are so successful. Yahoo Auctions doesn't do their business right. But there's a problem with that argument because Yahoo Auctions was first in Japan. And having entered in Japan first, they became the dominant operator for online auctions. And in the Japanese market, eBay couldn't enter and still hasn't entered. Well, they're, they're present, but they have a very small share. So that goes against this idea that, you know, whoever is dominant is dominant because of the superior technology. They're dominant because they were first. They took the market, so the winner takes it all. Because there are economies of scale that allow you to maintain an advantage permanently. And this is against what people typically would call, you know, Schumpeterian creative destruction, where for a, a, a temporary uh, a period you can maintain some monopoly power because you are the innovator and then that's going to be eaten away. If that power, that barrier that you have is because of permanent returns to scale, like in the platform case, then there's never going to be any Schumpeter, Schumpeterian creative destruction. Now, let me show you kind of the interpretation of, of investors, okay? Warren Buffett has famously always argued that when I make an investment, I want to make an investment in uh, what is a castle. He says a, a company is a castle, and I want the castle to be valuable. And I want to, be, uh, to have a duke who's in, charge, who's in charge of the castle, who knows what the castle's value is about, and who knows what, uh, uh, what should be done to maintain that castle valuable. But he says, above all, what I want is I want there to be a large and uh, 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 insurmountable moat around that castle. I don't want the ability for competitors to enter and to compete for what the value of that castle is. And this is exactly what happens in many of these uh, uh, um, companies that we've seen that have scale economies that are valuable because they are large and they have uh, returns to scale. And notice, this is not something that we see for the first time. This is not the first time that this has happened. If you go back to the late 19th century, 1900s, there was fast technological in innovation then too. Then the technologies were oil exploration, rail travel, electricity. And this gave rise to new companies like Standard Oil, owned by the Rockefellers, like many of the railway uh, companies that eventually became consolidated under the ownership of J.P. Morgan. Now, what happened then was it was clear that there was returns to scale. It was much more physical. Now the returns to scale are maybe network externalities. And now, uh, back then, it was really the huge cost of investment. You didn't want to have two railway lines next to each other competing. But this already gives us a hint that there's a way to solve this. But back then, of course, the solution took a long time. And unfortunately, also, history tells us that it was actually an unfortunate solution that we had because it took us a Great Depression and two wars in order to actually get rid of, rid of, of uh, uh, many of these, these dominant firms. So how can we do this better? How can we solve the dominance and these uh, returns to scale if you want? Yeah, the answer is not, you know, you say, the Americans would say, well, you have a funny Dutch accent, you must be saying split up these firms. Well. I say no, first of all, you know, I'm not Dutch. And second, uh, I don't argue for splitting up these, these firms. Why? Because I think we have to kind of embrace the returns to scale because these are the things that create value. So in a sense, we want to maintain the large networks, 
but we would like to have competitors on the network. So in, in, in our objective must be to maintain the scale economies, the hero part of the technology, but have competition on the networks, which is operators competing against each other in order to at the same time have the scale and yet the competition that, that gives us the pricing. And one of these examples, I think, um, and, and the more broad principle rather, would be what we call interoperability. Interoperability is, is, is a concept that comes from, from the tech uh, world. You know, the internet, the, the, the founding fathers of the internet build the internet on interoperability. And they said, if I want to send an email from one operator, uh, AOL in the United States, to the University of Zurich, I can do that because they're all on one network and there's different operators that are uh, uh, operating on this network. And, and my email is going to be recognized and accepted. Uh, notice that you can't send a, can send a, a, a WhatsApp from uh, uh, your, your WhatsApp account to a competing provider of one of these uh, uh, message services. So, so this interoperability is not kind of taken for granted. But one example in the telecom industry that, that gives us uh, an idea of what the role is of such interoperability is the, uh, the, 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 the mobile phone market. My phone plan when I'm in the United States with AT&T costs about two and a half times what it costs here in Europe with Movistar. And you'd say, well, is there any difference? The technology is the same. Um, I basically use the same device. The cell towers and the cell network is very similar. But there's one difference and there's a piece of regulation that's different. And that piece of regulation is that in the European market, because of an EU directive, you as an owner of a cell tower, you're forced to rent your towers to any competitor who wants to enter the market. So that means if I'm a small, say, Polish or German operator, I can enter the French market without building cell towers. So I don't have to build this expensive network, but I can operate on the existing network, of course, at a fee to compensate the owner for the existing network. And this gives rise to a lot of entry. And when entry happens, what entrants do is they lower their prices. They compete for the customers. And that's why the prices are two and a half times lower than with my AT&T plan, because AT&T doesn't have that interoperability rule, that separation of the network from the competing operators. And that's also why in the United States there's basically only three big operators and in the European market there's around uh, between 100 and 150 operators, which is basically exactly the type of competition that gives us the, the lower prices. So that all tells us that there's ways in which we can achieve competition um, while at the same time, you know, embracing the advantages of scale, embracing these network effects, uh, for example. So let me just uh, uh, wrap up and say, you know, next time you hear a news report on the Dow Jones reaching new highs, and for sure we'll reach 40,000 uh, pretty soon, who knows where it will end, I want you to think twice, because think twice about what that means for the economy, the rest of the economy. And we've known from history and we've known, we've observed in recent decades that this has fairly negative effects on the macroeconomy as a whole, on the labor market, on startups. And in the past, history has told us that, you know, this has been solved often in not, not such favorable ways. I mean, I don't think we want to repeat history uh, the way we've seen it in the last uh, uh, 100 years. And I think there's ways in which we can do better. And it's up to us whether we want to do that. And the most important thing is that we have to foster competition. More competition is the answer. And this is true whether you're talking about eBay, but also about the textile industry, the beer industry. More competition is going to give us that. More innovation and making sure that all these startups that are now uh, ha not having the ability to, to, to flourish, that they do have that uh, uh, possibility, uh, startups like the one by my friend Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jan, for this uh, fantastic presentation. Um, before we start with the questions, I'd like to remind uh, you, our audience, that you can uh, still submit questions. In fact, I've uh, already gotten a list of questions here on my iPad. 
Uh, just as a reminder, you can still log in uh, on Menti uh, with the code 5252450 and see all the questions that are already in there and uh, potentially add uh, other questions if, if your favorite question isn't there yet. So while we wait for more questions to come in, I thought I'd start with some of my own questions. And the first one, uh, Jan, obviously you talked a lot about market power and rising profits. Uh, one policy tool that is a lot uh, in, the, in the media right now and discussed in the public debate uh, is obviously the taxation of these big companies, right? In fact, the G7 just agreed on an international minimum corporate tax for big multinational companies. Uh, and in fact, I think this will become a rea reality probably pretty soon at the OECD level, uh, at least. And I know that, of course, a lot of these proposals have to do more with closing loopholes and uh, tax havens and making sure that these companies, in fact, pay any uh, taxes and not just book all their profits in, in tax havens. But do you think it, or it could also be a useful tool in, in the context of market power and, and dealing with the, with, with, uh, the, with the problems about competition that you've uh, talked about, uh, say, as a sort of complementary instrument relative to more you know, classic antitrust policy? Or do, do you think it doesn't really get at the root uh, of the problem? Well, I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I think it's, it's positive for two reasons. One, I think that the solution uh, is going to have to be global because the problem is global. Sometimes people ask, is this something just about the United States? Uh, and the answer is no. We see this also for European firms. And uh, it's a global problem. Even if it was only for the American firms, we all use devices and services that are you know, used around the world. And so it doesn't matter where the ownership resides. So given it's a global problem, we need a global solution. And as you said, this, this G7... Uh, agreement or, or at least proposal to coordinate is, is, I think, a big step forward to do something about it globally. Uh, second, also, of course, if this is going on, there's this uh, issue that market power affects the, the economy. We can correct and, and, and uh, above all, also redistribute resources. Okay? There's, there's a lot of resources, and you said it's about loopholes and tax havens, but, but even beyond that, you know, by taxing some of these profits, we can uh, uh, relieve some of the taxation on, on, on labor income, for example. So, so there's a, a redistribution. And then the third, and that's the more challenging question, what can be done in order to actually solve the root cause of the problem? Okay? And there, I think it's more mixed because, of course, by Tax, taxing uh, the firms, you're not necessarily going to reduce their incentives to set their prices high. And there is a form of, uh, uh, of, of uh, a source why they have market power, for example, scale economies. And, and that is, of course, not going to allow us to get around this uh, immediately. To some extent, this is going to work because, of course, your incentives to uh, uh, invest in, in, in make capital investments may be affected. There's going to be incentives for the uh, executives. So, so there's going to be roles, but it's not going to, I think, fully solve the problem. All that said, you know, I think it's going to be a, a, a very important way to address some of the, uh, the, 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 the problems, even if it doesn't do it all. I mean, one uh, counterintuitive thing with tax policy there is actually that these Firms are huge, but they're still too small in terms of their output, right? So, so you should really yeah. subsidize their output. If yeah. anything, you should tax their profits, yeah. but subsidize their output. Yeah. Maybe you could combine it with entry subsidies uh, to, to foster competition, but uh, probably it doesn't really get at the root cause of you know, scale economies and right. so forth. Right. Um, my second question was that you know, when, when I read your book, uh, what's really, and I can really encourage everyone to buy the book and read the book, it's a fantastic book. The great thing is that you conclude with a very concrete list of policy proposals um, to deal with the uh, problem of rising market power. You already talked about interoperability, uh, but you have a series of other suggestions. You know, you suggest, for instance, to switch the burden of proof in merger review that, you know, rather than the competition authorities having to prove that it would actually be a merger would be detrimental to competition. It should be the opposite, that the companies should prove that they would actually achieve some synergies. 
Um, and one other uh, idea that I found intriguing is that you say there should be an independent federal competition authority, right? A bit like central banks dealing independently with monetary policy. There should be an, another independent authority to, you know, regulate markets and make sure that they remain competitive. So one thing I was wondering in that context is that if you think about the ECB or the Fed, for instance, they have a very simple, clear mandate, right, that you can even boil down to a number. Think of the 2% inflation target. What exactly would be the mandate of such a, a competition authority? And wouldn't it be a bit tricky to sort of specify it in a, in a simple number uh, and a simple objective that would be transparent enough to also allow us to check expose whether that authority has actually been doing a good job or not, right? That would be important for us to be able to actually evaluate the success of such, a, such an authority. No, Florian, that's, that's a great point. I mean, the, the, the central bank's inflation mandate is, is simple. Uh, it's maybe not so easy to achieve it, but it's, it's clear what the objective is. With market power, the problem is, first of all, measurement. How much is the market power? What is the market power exactly in terms of the market structure? Which are the firms? So, so it's, it's a lot more complex. Um, and I completely uh, agree that, that that's a, a challenging uh, uh, objective to, 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 to achieve. I do want to say that the central bank does more than just inflation uh, uh, targeting because what the central bank really does is it's also doing a lot of uh, uh, banking supervision. And I think we have to look more in the direction of the banking supervision. You know, they're making sure that for example, the, uh, uh, the, the, the requirements in terms of uh, um, deposit requirements are met. Uh, you know, banks, I'm sure, don't like that intervention, but it's, it's a way to, you know, to enforce the Basel agreements and, and targets. So there is more to central banking than just the, the, the inflation targeting. And, but all that said, you know, it's going to take a lot more resources. Uh, if you look at what the central bank in the United States, the central banking system has about 27,000 people. According to Lucas's calculation, the cost of inflation is about half a percent of uh, GDP. Well, different people have different estimates what the cost of the kind of aggregate cost of uh, the macroeconomic cost of, uh, uh, of, of market power is, but it's around 8 to 10 percent. In antitrust in the United States, there's about 2,000 people. Okay, so the first thing is I, you know, resources are definitely going to help in terms of doing that banking supervision, but on, on, on different uh, sectors. And, and I think Thomas Philippon, who also has a very interesting book on, on, on the issue, has pointed out in his book, you know, that many of these large firms, what they really want, they want to become like the banks because they want to become too big to fail. When we had the outage of Facebook uh, a month ago, or some, people were saying, you know, there's so much business that's lost because we're having now companies that ideally they would like to be too big to fail, uh, which is a way for them to... Um, you know, to, to, to be able to, to justify that they have to be so big. And, and I think, you know, just to, to, uh, to reiterate your, your concern, it's going to be hard, but I think there's more that we can do than we, we're doing right now. So um, let me turn to the questions that uh, the audience has actually submitted. Uh, there's a whole range of uh, questions already in the system here in Menti, and uh, people have voted very actively. Now, the most, by far most popular question is actually, wouldn't it be necessary to break up the tech giants? I guess you've sort of already answered that, that you would not be necessarily in favor of that. Nonetheless, I guess in DC, there's a lot of talk about breaking up tech and Silicon Valley. And I guess there would be examples like where you could say we could st still break up WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram, for instance. So in some cases, I guess it would be possible. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be uh, optimal, clearly, to have two Ebays. So uh, what's your general answer? When should we break up things and when should we leave things in place and regulate them? I mean, I think the example of Facebook, uh, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram, I think is the, the best example where I personally would argue that it's good to break them up. The reason why they ha they're together is because of a merger or an acquisition. And so, you know... I guess antitrust should not never have allowed uh, this to happen, uh, and, and therefore I, I, I would think that it's a, a good idea, if possible, because of course uh, Zuckerberg has said I, I, I want to scramble the eggs as much as possible so that we can't really you know separate them anymore. I think in that case it, it, it's clear. It's less clear if a company has grown, as we call it, organically, like an eBay, 
if an eBay has 90% or 95% of the market, it, it's a sign, and they haven't done this through uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's a sign that there is value in having such a large platform. And there, in my view, it would be a mistake to force an eBay to, to, to split up. Can we think of different ways of allowing operators with regulation, for example, say, you know, you can allow anyone else to sell the services on your network, on your base of buyers and sellers, at a fee that's going to be set by a regulator. Of course, that means that an eBay won't be able to charge 7 or 8% for a transaction. They will have to charge half a percent. Or that um, Apple in its Apple Store uh, isn't uh, allowed to charge 30% for Epic Games for every, every time a kid downloads a game. Uh, so so you know, those large platforms are valuable because they're large. And I, I think we have to be very careful when we talk about splitting up. Some of them will work, but most of them I would be uh, more, more, more cautious. Great. So you showed these um, graphs at the beginning about uh, stock market valuations and how, how well uh, these valuations have been doing in the last 40 years. So here is a question about uh, what part of this stock market growth can be actually attributed to monetary policy that is cheap money, low interest rates. Sure. I mean, um, we, we, we might in, to, to in, in part also see, see some of that going on. Um, you know, again, like as, as we know, when we do research, we, we, we focus on, on, on one particular question. I, I, I don't want to claim that everything is exp explained by that. What we try and do in the kind of the research that, that's backing up uh, um, uh, these, these facts is we show for sure that there's a, a clear relationship between the, the dominance of these firms through their market power and how it affects, for example, uh, wages and how it affects uh, startups and how it affects uh, uh, reallocation uh, uh, of, of, of workers. There's definitely other things that are going on. In particular, we had the, the sharp fall in, uh, in, in, in inflation in the early 80s. There's another thing that, that I think is also important, and in the book I talk about it, I didn't talk about it today, which is the, the whole idea of the ideology behind antitrust. I mean, there was the, the shift, you know, we had the split of, 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 uh, of Bell uh, over AT&T into the baby Bells, and that went through the 70s, was finalized in the early 80s. And then people with what they call the Borg Doctrine, which was basically by the uh, legal scholar and, and politician uh, Borg, said, you know, we only have to focus on consumer surplus. That's the only objective that antitrust should have in mind. And therefore, we should definitely not split up these uh, firms. And, and this has changed, of course, what has happened with mergers and acquisitions and merger review. And I think some of that is also uh, 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 responsible for what we see. I think in the, for example, the beer industry, it's not necessarily the fact that it's technological change, although there's a big network there of, of wholesale and, and, and uh, uh, retail, but where, you know, the fact that in, in, in uh, AB InBev before uh, InBev bought uh, Anheuser-Busch, well, maybe the merger or the antitrust authorities should have looked at that merger more carefully and, and not allow them to become such a dominant player that they have 30% or 35% of the, the, the beer market. Cool. So here is a question about uh, the political influence of these companies, right? These powerful in influence have better lobbyists, and this means that while we need governments, they may also be captured, right? That's the common concern about, you know, tech capturing Washington, D.C. How, do, uh, how should we produce a meaningful change in such an environment where sort of, you know, increasing profits generate more political influence, and then political influence can be used to tilt the system even more in favor of even higher profits. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is this is the the one million dollar question. I think this is one of the the, the best things that we, we we should think about in the sense that there is a vicious circle. If you start to have monopoly power, you have money in your account, and you can use that to influence policies that basically go in favor of you having more monopoly power that increases the amount of money you have. And, and it's a, a vicious circle that it's not just capture, you completely control the, the, the process that determines what happens in, in, in your market. Now, solving that is hard because this is not just an economic solution. This is about institutions. This is about uh, politics. When I was referring, and you were referring to this independent, uh, this federal independent uh, authority, you know, in, in a way, that is an, an attempt to take it away from politicians. What happens 
with the central bank. And again, at, at least in terms of the 2% inflation, which is an easy target, what we're saying is we see power is going to be renewed. But, you know, it's, it's, there is some political meddling, but he's got a, a fixed term. And in the meantime, you cannot do anything about it. And he has one objective, which is the 2% inflation. And I think if, if he would have some more independence in terms of uh, I'm not saying that the judges, for example, in the Department of Just, uh, Justice or that the European Commission, that these are, they are not independent, but there's a, a combination of the fact that there's so many cases, little resources, and with an authority that's actually distant from the political process, it's going to be much uh, 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 more effective in achieving these outcomes. Is it going to be easy? Not at all. I mean, it's going to be a very hard problem. To I mean, if politicians are still st setting the rules of the game, uh, the mandate of that authority, uh, should they look at, you know, what should be the burden of proof? Should they look at consumer surplus, but also, or also wages and other stakeholders? Then, you know, it could be, we could be back to the same problem that, yeah. that sort of the, rein in. The, the only thing I see is that at the moment, you know, the argument that I, I try to make, and that also, you know, this is not just me, but with, with a lot of, of co-authors, one of the things that we find is that if you have enough of these dominant firms, there's not many of them, that, you know, it can be, it's probably around 400 globally, they're very big, not many out of the 100 million firms that we have in the world, but they are, of course, a huge chunk of GDP. All of them, it's not that Google treats badly its workers. It's the fact that Google and Facebook and AB InBev and, and Inditex and all these large firms jointly have an equilibrium effect okay, on the economy, affecting wages, affecting startups. And this is something that is so far away from what happens in terms of policy, in terms of antitrust, because there's no connection between these outcomes uh, at all. I, I like to think of it as, you know, in terms of, Antitrust, and, and if you talk to lawyers, they say we solve practical problems. And I think it's like sitting, you know, you're sitting on trying to serve you with your board. You're looking at a one meter wave. You're thinking, okay, how shall I take it? How shall I solve it? There's a few others, many ways, but they do it. And there's a tsunami coming, and we don't see the tsunami. And, and I think there's something going on there that we're focusing on these, you know, problems. Let's do consumer surplus because this is important, but there's a lot of other things that are being affected because it's such a major thing that's going on at the same time. It's a, it's a macroeconomic It's issue. a macroeconomic problem. Um, so here's a question, I guess, related to the wage uh, growth numbers that you've showed and how to interpret that, which is about uh, what about all the innovation and benefits of these large companies that are not reflected in higher wages, but in better services and products, right? So we have the iPhone because of Apple. Uh, how does is get that get does that get reflected in these wage I mean, numbers? Again, first of all, I want to say there's the hero part of all this technological change. So, so you know, we really want that technological change, and we want those platforms. Okay, so so that that's the first thing. Of course, this is a, a matter of how we measure GDP too, right? So, so does GDP adequately measure? the value of, uh, uh, of, of the surplus that we're producing in, in, in the economy. And I, 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 I think that th that's a, a serious uh, channel, a challenge. I think there's no doubt that a larger chunk is going to profits. Okay? And if it's the case that, you know, it, it cannot be that the wages are going to be higher than the GDP. Okay, that they share. So, so, so it, it must be going somewhere. Is there a, a challenging uh, uh, problem in terms of how to properly me measure it? Definitely, uh, and, and especially with fast technological changes we've seen uh, in the past. Here's a question about what we as an individual uh, could do to break the power of big business. Is there anything concrete that I could do in my own life? Should I boycott? Uh, you know, social media, or would that make no difference, really, because it's sort of a, an aggregate problem and, and it needs a global solution? I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's a little bit comparable to global warming, that it's clear that if I take my bike, this is not going to make any difference compared to going in a car to the global warming problem. But if everyone took their bike, it would make a difference. I think that the first step is an issue of information. Okay? That I think we are not aware of many of the issues, the consequences that are going on. And, and you know, one of the problems, for example, we have with new technologies is that people say, I mean, what's bad about having Google Maps, which is for free? 
Okay, and then we say, well, you know, this is a product that's not really priced right because the pricing is going through who pays for the advertising and that's overpriced and therefore really you should get from Google either money or some services that if there was competition between these, uh, uh, these um, advertising providers th that you would get more services from them. The thing is, it's very hard to explain, but I, I, I think we have to start there. The first thing is make clear that there's a serious impact in the economy that is affecting everyone from prices that you do pay or even the ones that you don't pay like with Google Maps but also on uh, about 85 percent of the workforce's wages also on the startups also eventually on the innovation and on the uh, uh, growth of, of, of the economy so so it affects us all but I think, you know, once we get the message out, that's already one thing. The second thing is I think we have to look for a global solution. And that's why I'm so uh, uh, optimistic about this uh, uh, G7 taxation agreement, which I think it's, it's hinting at, okay, we want to have the big economies do something about it. They, 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 they have the mindset. We've seen Glasgow, maybe it's been a very weak kind of uh, a resolution in terms of, of global warming, but at least let's start to think about uh, s some of these, these solutions uh, for these serious problems. And I, I think it's a serious problem. Uh, here's the last question I wanted to forward to you, which is, you know, about this network regulation. Um, splitting the network from the provider does not always work. Uh, if there's capacity bottlenecks, actually we've seen examples, if you think about electricity market deregulation, where we've tried that some of the railway markets yeah, yeah. that haven't been super successful in implementing that. Um, so is it just about splitting the network from the provider, the interoperability, or does it need even more regulation? I mean, first of all, every case is specific, and that's why I think, you know, if you have an authority which has resources that can look at each case, that's already going to help. Mm -hmm. Second, will we be able to solve all the problems? I'm sure we will not. It took us about 100 years to regulate electricity. We haven't solved it either. But it's probably a lot better than it was if it was privately provided. You know, a, a lot of the public, transport, public transport, transportation now, you know, was privately provided before. We ended up making it public, but there's other solutions that we can have. We can provide networks privately, and we can have... Uh, in, in transportation, we can have uh, 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 kind of companies competing on it. But yes, with information, it's going to be very complex. Some of these examples, bottlenecks and things like that, are going to maybe make it impossible to regulate it. I do think that there's probably some regulation that's going to be better than none at all. And then it's a question of how far we can go. The same with taxation. You know, ideal taxation doesn't exist because we're looking at second best. But let's now ask the question, how far can we uh, go? Excellent. Thanks so much, Jan, for this uh, very lively discussion and a great talk. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot during the past hour. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, uh, for participating today and sending us questions and you know, participating in the polls. We hope that we've stimulated your interest in our upcoming events. In fact, next year will be very important for us because the UBS Center will celebrate its 10-year anniversary. And so on April 7, we will kick off that anniversary year with the Wirtschaftspodium Schweiz. We'll take up again the topic of the very first edition of the podium back in 2013, namely Wirtschaftsstandort Schweiz, an Erfolgsmodell in Gefahr. Given the challenges that we're currently facing here in Switzerland, I'm sure that will give rise to a lot of lively uh, discussion. And then on June 20th, we will hold a lecture at the University of Zurich with Nobel laureates Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee on their new book, Good Economics for Hard Times. So if you'd like to receive updates on our events and activities, please subscribe to our newsletter. We look forward to welcoming you back next spring. In the meantime, I invite you to follow the discussion on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, whatever else there is. You can find all this information also on our website, ubscenter.uzh.ch. Thank you and goodbye.